Welcome everyone, this is another Chris Chorus with your host Chris, and today we are going to be coding Space Invaders. So in this version, we are going to go ahead and make sure that we code everything that you see right here, and I even wrote out a nice to-do list for us. The very first thing we're going to do is set up our project, of course. We need some sort of canvas to do this on, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and create a player. So if I go ahead and refresh this, I died there. We're going to create this player at the bottom, which we can move side to side. And then we want to create projectiles from our player. So you'll see right here when I start shooting at these little invaders, eventually our projectiles go and they destroy the invaders and eventually some new ones will spawn. We're going to be creating grids of these at intervals. So you'll see some new invaders just popped up. I'm going to show you how to create those new grids at different columns, different row sizes. We're going to add in these nice little enemy explosions. You'll see we have some really cool particle effects in there. We're going to add those in. And then we're also going to add some background stars that move. So when Whenever these go down, we're going to spawn some new ones at the very top of our game. And then finally, we have a lose condition, a score, and then we're going to make this a fixed width canvas, basically restricted to some dimensions so it's playable on most screen sizes. So we're going to cover all of this in this tutorial, but if you would like to take this to the next level, I will be doing a premium course on this Invaders game, and it's going to look like this over here. So if I go ahead and refresh, looks pretty much the same for the most part, but you'll see we're going to be spawning some bombs in here. And when I hit one of these bombs, they explode. And let me try to hit one with some enemies. You'll see it just takes out any enemies that it hits. You may have also noticed that there is this little yellow orb going across the screen. Every now and then, I'm going to show you what happens when I hit that. Go ahead and try to get that. We're going to add in this automatic power up as you see right there. And we're also going to be adding in some dynamic score labels. You'll see when I hit these enemies while well, the labels are appearing and disappearing. But everything you need to know to create some sort of base invaders game, we're going to be covering in this tutorial. So let's go ahead and get started. First thing we want to do is we want to set up our project. So this is simple enough. What we're going to do is we're going to open up our finder and find a location in which we want to put our project. So right now I'm within my downloads folder, but I always like putting all my web projects within my web folder. So I'm going to go inside of there and then I want to create a new folder in here. So I'm going to hit command shift N for me on Mac and I'm going to go ahead and call this space dash invaders. So now that I have this folder, what I can do is I can drag it on top of my text editor to open it up as a project. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and drag this on top of Sublime Text. And now you'll see I'm inside of this folder. I even have a file open, but there is nothing inside of it and we haven't actually saved this one file. So let's go ahead and do that now. If I hit Command S, it's going to ask us, what do we want to save this as? Well, first, I know I want to save it under my web folder inside of Space Invaders. So I want to make sure that I have Space Invaders selected, and then I want to save this as no other than index.html. So I'm going to go ahead and save it as that. We have our first file, but we're going to need one more file, and that is going to be index.js. So all I'm going to do here is I'm going to open up a new tab with Command N, and then I'm going to save this as well with Command S using shortcuts to go pretty quickly here. So I want to save this as not index.html, but rather index.js. This is where we're going to write all of our programmatic code. So I'm going to go ahead and hit save. And we pretty much have this set up for most of our projects, but first let's go ahead and open up index.html. I'm going to right click on this, hit reveal in finder. And now that I have it open in Finder once more, I can double click on index.html. This is what our project currently looks like. Nothing on the screen, just a blank index.html file. So in order to code our game over here, we want to create some sort of HTML canvas element. So if we want to do that, we'll go back to index.html and we will create no other than a canvas element. It should look like this. So if I save and refresh and then I inspect, you're going to see we have a canvas on our screen within our body tags. All of this is wrapped around canvas automatically thanks to Chrome. We don't need to add any of that default HTML boilerplate. But now that we have this canvas in place, we need to make sure that we select it within our JavaScript file. So how do we select our canvas over here? Well, simply what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and create a const called canvas. And this is going to be equal to document.query selector. Now what element do we want to select from index.html? We only have one, so it's pretty easy. We're going to go ahead and select canvas. We can console log this out to make sure that we have this canvas element. Refresh, and then I'm going to pull this to the side, open up our console, and you'll see we're not getting anything red. That means there is a connection issue between index.js and index.html. So in order to connect these two, we need to create a script tag should look like this. And now we need a reference, a source attribute that says, well, what script do we want to pull in here? No other than 
index.js, which is going to be right here. So once we add the script tag with the associated source and refresh, you're going to see now we're console logging out our canvas element because we have this console log that is correct. So we can delete it. And now we're going to want to reference our canvas context. So to get the context, I'm going to call this C. That's pretty much what I always call it just because it is short and easy to select. And I want to go ahead and select our canvas, get context method and specify I want the 2D context because I want all of the methods associated with canvas for a 2D game. So looking good, but one thing I definitely want to do is I want to go ahead and resize this canvas to take out the full width and height of our screen. So you can do this within CSS. I always like doing it within JavaScript, so I'm going to continue doing it that way. I'm going to go ahead and select our canvas, getting its width, and then I'm going to set it equal to our inner width. Where does inner width come from? Well, it comes from the window dot object. So when we look at our window, the window is the full width of our browser window, but if we are referencing a property directly within window, such as inner width, we don't actually need the window dot. The browser is smart enough to know we are referencing window dot inner width if we get rid of it. So it's a little cleaner for your code if you understand that these properties are coming directly from the window object. So if I refresh and inspect, you'll see our canvas now takes up the full width of the screen. And now I want to do the same thing for our height. So I'm going to copy this line, paste it. And then I want to select our height and rather than set our height to inner width, we want to set it to inner height, which also comes from window dot window window. You get the idea. So if I go ahead and save that and refresh, you'll see our canvas takes up the full width and height of the screen, but we have one issue, which is we have this little border on the left and the top of our canvas. This is just default margin that is provided by the browser by default. I don't know why it's provided by default, but that is what Chrome provides. So I'm going to go ahead and add some style tags within index.html. And I want to go ahead and select our body tag because you'll see over here, if I select body, this little orange margin is, well, margin. We want to make sure that we have no margin. So we're going to go ahead and add margin into our CSS right here and say our margin should be zero for body. If I save and refresh, inspect our canvas, now it takes up the full width and height. We no longer have any gutter. We no longer have any margin. So we are good to go with continuing onwards towards developing this game. So if I go back to to-dos, I can go ahead and check off project setup. So let's go ahead and move on to create a player next. If I want to go ahead and create a player on our screen, what do I need to do? Well, I need to go within index.js and I need to create a player class. So whenever I create a class, I like creating a constructor and this method is going to be fired whenever we create or instantiate a new player. So what kind of properties are associated with our player? How do we actually move our player across the screen? And what describes a player, should I say? So I know that my player should be able to move and be positioned on the screen. Position, that is a property. So I wanna go ahead and add in this dot position. Now, what kind of properties does position have? Well, we have a 2D game, so we're going to have an X position, which means we're going to be along the X axis, and then we're going to have Y position, which means we're going to be moving on the Y axis. So I'm going to go ahead and say position should be equal to an object with an X property. We'll set it equal to 200 to start, which is going to be somewhere over here. And then I'm going to add a Y property, which should also be around 200 to start. So with this, our player should be placed somewhere over here because our Y value right here starts from the top of the canvas instead of the bottom. That's the only thing that's reversed. X still starts from the left to the right, but the values for the Y start off really low, so zero, and then they increase as we go downwards. So we're placing our player somewhere over here. I'm going to go ahead and save that. And I also know that our player is going to have a velocity associated with it because he's going to be moving around the screen. Whenever something moves on the screen, it's pretty typical that you're going to add in a this.velocity property. And same thing with position. We're going to have an x velocity set equal to zero to start. And we can also have a y velocity if we desire. We're not going to use it for this game, but we'll go ahead and add it anyways in case you want to expand yours. I'm going to go ahead and say y velocity should be equal to zero. Now, what else does a player have? Well, we need some sort of image, some sort of spaceship image. I'm going to go ahead and add in one more property for this image. Say this dot to image should be equal to, well, we don't have anything just yet, so I'll comment it out. And eventually we're going to need to declare a width and height for our player as well, specifically for our image. So we'll go ahead and say this dot width is going to be equal to 100 to start. And this dot height should be equal to 100 to start as well. Our player is going to have box collision detection. So with all of this, we can begin drawing out our player. 
Now, what does a player look like to start? Let's go ahead and just make it a red square. So if I want to go ahead and select some sort of fill style, C dot fill style using our context here with all those methods for canvas, I'm going to set our fill style equal to red. And then I want to go ahead and use fill rect and make sure that rect is uppercase R. And then I can specify, well, what are the X, Y width and height of our rectangle? Our X is going to be, well, our player's position on the X axis our y is going to be our player's position on the y-axis, and then our width is going to be simply this dot width, and then our height is going to be simply this dot height. So that is what our player is going to look like, and now that we have some sort of definition for what our player looks like, we can go ahead and draw it out on the screen. So how am I going to draw this out? Well, right below our class of player, I can go ahead and create a const called player, lowercase p, because this is not a class, and I want to go ahead and instantiate a new player. Now a new player doesn't have any constructor arguments, so we don't need to pass anything through. This should go ahead and create our player, but it's not going to draw anything until we select our player and call the draw method on top of it. So if I go ahead and save and refresh, now our player is drawn on the screen. This is going to be our first step, but obviously our player should not look like a red square, but we know it's working, it's rendered out on the screen. So what should our player look like? Well. I created a spaceship file exactly for this. This is going to be available within the description of the video. So if I go ahead into my downloads folder, I should see untitled folder 127, great name by the way. And within this, I'm going to have spaceship.png. This is going to be the image file we're going to use for our player right here. So when you download this, I want you to go ahead and copy or drag this file and two, no other than Space Invaders. Now we might have a few more images within our project, so it makes sense to create a new folder called IMG, short for image. And now I can go ahead and drag spaceship.png inside of it, and we can begin using it within our game. So how am I going to go ahead and draw this image out for our player? Well, it's going to start within our draw method. So within our draw method, I can call C dot draw image and this is going to take a few arguments the first being a canvas image source image so this is basically just an html image and we can create one of these using javascript so i'm going to do it within our constructor function and here i'm going to create a const called image simple enough right this is going to be equal to new image this image object comes directly from the javascript api it's pulled in automatically we don't need to import it or anything like that so it's already there for us but in order to declare what image we want to use we need to set this new image const specifically the source property on it to a specific url what is that url going to be well it's going to be within this image folder so dot slash img slash and then what is the name of the image no other than spaceship.png so we have this html image available for us now we just want to go ahead and set this dot image equal to it so i'll go ahead and uncomment this dot image and set it equal to our image right here so now that we have this in place we can use it within c.draw image what i'm going to do is i'm going to go ahead and reference our property of this dot image and the next thing that draw image takes is an x and y position so what is the x position of our player it's going to be this dot position dot x and then we need to do the same thing for y so we'll reference this dot position dot y so we can go ahead and comment out this code it's kind of useful at times to have some sort of red box around your player later on for debugging we don't need it right now but i also don't want to get rid of it completely so i'm just going to comment it out then i want to refresh and our player is not being drawn why is that well i can tell you right now the reason being is because we're trying to load in this image into image.source and loading some sort of image with either kilobytes or megabytes associated with it is going to take time what's happening now is we are calling player.draw before this is actually loaded therefore we just don't see anything on the screen we don't have any console issues or anything it's just simply not loaded so right now we're only calling player.draw when we load index.html and index.js. We're only calling it once. We want to make sure that this is called over and over again. So when that image.source is actually loaded, we can actually draw it out on the screen. So what we're going to do is we're going to create an animation loop. And to do that, we're going to create a function called animate. And then inside of this function, I'm going to call something reference from window dot. It's going to be request animation frame like so and now this takes one argument what is the function that i want to call over and over and over again 
Well, it's simply animate. We're going to call this function to create some sort of animation loop to call this over and over and over again. So once we go ahead and do that, we can console log out some text to make sure it's working. You're going to see if I do this by default, save and refresh, nothing is going to show because in order for this to actually run, we need to make sure that we call animate in the first place. So I go ahead and save, refresh, you're going to see this just loops over and over again. Now we can use this to actually draw out our player. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of console log. And instead of console log, I'm going to call player.draw. So let's go ahead and save and refresh. And now our image is being drawn out simply because it had enough time to load. And when we call c.draw image again, when this image is actually loaded, well, it's going to draw it out on the screen. Now, obvious issue here is our background is white and our spaceship is white. Space is not white, it is black. So we wanna go ahead and change the background of our canvas so that it has a black background instead of white. How do we do this within JavaScript and Canvas? Well, within our animate loop, we can go ahead and select our context and then call fill rect, which takes four arguments. The first is going to be the X position of where we wanna draw this rectangle. I wanna cover the full canvas. So I'm going to start it at the very top left of the screen with a zero and zero for X and Y. Then I need to specify how wide should this rectangle be. So the full width of our canvas, and I can get that with canvas.width. And then the last thing I want is the full height of our canvas, which I can get with canvas.height. So if I go ahead and save this and refresh, it's going to be black by default, but we do want to specify explicitly that this is a black color because if we ever use fill style later on, this is going to change to whatever fill style we use for something else. So we want to go ahead and specify right before fill rect that we have a fill style and this should be equal to black like so. So on refresh, everything still looks the same, but that should take care of any bugs later on regarding fill styles. So right now we're just loading in our image with its default width and height. And we specified right here that the width and height of our player should actually be 100, 100. But in order for this to take effect, we need to integrate it within draw image. So we have three arguments, but the next two are going to be the width and height of the image. So I can go ahead and say our width should be equal to 100 and our height should also be equal to 100 with two additional arguments. So I do this, save and refresh. We have a 100 by 100 spaceship, but it is definitely squished now. It looks kind of dumb. We don't want this. We want to go ahead and say that our default width and height should be equal to the default width and height of the image. So what we can do is we can go ahead and grab our image object that we created and reference the width and then the image dot height of the image we pulled in. So if I save, and refresh. Well, we don't see anything again. Why is that? Well, if your image just isn't showing by default and it's giving you issues, it's likely, well, this image just hasn't finished loading. So we want to go ahead and set all of this when this image has actually finished loading. How do we do that? Well, we can go ahead and call our image object. And then on top of this, we want to say on load. This is going to listen for whenever this image has fully loaded. It's going to be equal to an arrow function, a callback function. So we could say whenever our image actually loads, we want to take these three lines of code and then set them to the properties associated with our image. So whenever our image finishes loading, we're going to load these and we should be good to go. So I go ahead and save and refresh. Well, now we are getting one more issue. And this usually happens when we try to call draw image on this dot image when this dot image isn't loaded. It's always down to loading. So in order to fix this issue, we can go ahead and say, we only want to call C dot draw image if this dot image actually exists. And since we only have one statement actually following this if conditional, well, we don't need to add brackets here. We can go ahead and take them out completely, but if we were to add more statements here, we need the brackets. But this is just shorthand JavaScript, makes our code a little cleaner because, well, we don't need brackets. So I can go ahead and save and refresh, and that goes ahead and fixes everything. The width and height of our image is the exact width and height that came with the image in the first place. But the cool thing is, is right here, we can go ahead and multiply this by some sort of value to make it smaller, some sort of scale value. So if I go ahead and say, I want our width to be 0.15 times smaller than what it is right now, and do the same thing for our height to shrink it down while maintaining the aspect ratio, I can go ahead and save this, refresh, and now you see that we have a smaller image it's shrunk down, but it also maintains that aspect ratio we want. So looking back at this, it's not really descriptive calling this 0.15 when we can go ahead and replace this with some sort of constant, some sort of variable that actually describes what this value is. So to be more descriptive, I can go ahead and copy 0.15 
create a constant called scale, set it equal to no other than 0.15, and now right here, I can replace 0.15 in both places with scale, like so. So now I know what this value is, it's simply the scale in which we are reducing our image at. So save and refresh, things still work. So now let's go ahead and get our player position in the correct spot. I want our spaceship here to be placed at the bottom of the screen and right in the middle of our canvas. So how are we going to do that? Well, we know our player is being drawn using draw image and it's affected by this dot position X and this dot position Y. We're setting it equal to 200 by 200 by default, but we want it to be right in the middle of the canvas. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select our canvas width for X. If I save this and refresh, we're moving our player completely off the screen. But if I divide this by two, we're moving it to the middle, but it's not completely in the middle because our x-axis starts on the left side of our image. So we need to move our player over to the left by the size of our image width. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract this dot width divided by two, which is going to give us exactly what we need. This value right here divided by two, save and refresh, and we're gone again. Why is this? Well, we're trying to set our position based off of a value that is being loaded within image.onload. So what we'll do is we'll grab this dot position and we're just going to paste it inside of image.load, like so. So now, if I go ahead and refresh, we see that our image is placed perfectly within the center, but now we need to go ahead and get our player down here at the bottom. So what I can do here is I can set our position for the Y axis equal to our canvas height. If I save and refresh, well, we're off the screen, but if I subtract our image height, we should be at the very bottom, which we are now, but we don't have a lot of breathing room down there. Let's go ahead and subtract a static value of just 20 to give us a little space from the bottom. I think that looks really good. So now if we look within our to-dos, we can go ahead and say we successfully created a player. Now it is time to move our player across the bottom of the screen so we can begin dodging projectiles and shooting projectiles as we wish. So in order to move our player, we're going to need to listen for some sort of event. What kind of event do we need to listen for? Well, simply our key down and our key up events. So I'm going to go ahead to the bottom of our file right here and below animate, I'm going to add in, add event, listener. This is also called from window dot, but we don't need window dot. So we're going to go ahead and call add event listener. What event do we want to listen for? Well, simply key down. And then we want to call some sort of function. So an arrow function that is responding to whenever we key down on our keyboard. So I can console log out key down like so. And when I save this code or refresh and start pressing on my keyboard, make sure that you're not pressing inside your console, but you're actually selecting your canvas and then pressing down. You'll see we're console logging out key down. So here we have an event object. And if I go ahead and console log our event object out like so, save and refresh, start pressing on our keyboard. You're going to see we have this keyboard event. Now inside of this, we have something called a key code. So this is a code associated with our key and we can use this to determine what key was pressed down and respond to that specific key. But we also have a property called key. This is a newer, more up-to-date way of doing things. So what we can do is we can go ahead and select our event.key to see exactly what it is we're pressing down. So if I refresh with that saved, start pressing down our keyboard, A, we have A logged out, S, S, and then D, D is logged out. So this is how we're going to determine which key we are pressing. Now, if we just want this key property, we don't need a reference event directly. We can go ahead and add opening and closing curly brackets inside of here to do what is called object destructuring. We're basically just going to go ahead and get the property directly without actually referencing the parent object. So I know I just want to get key. I'm going to go ahead and put key in between these curly brackets. And now if I console log out, just key with that, save and refresh, start pressing down. You'll see it works exactly as expected. So now that we know what keys we're pressing down, we can go ahead and add a switch case statement, which is going to look like this, switch opening and closing parentheses. What do we want to switch out here? Well, simply our key that we're pressing down. And when we press a case of no other than A, so our A key, we want to do something. So we're going to add a colon right here. What do we want to do? We want to console log out left. And then I'm going to go ahead and end this statement with a break statement. So I'm going to go ahead, save and refresh. And now when I press A, we are console logging out to left. But when I press any of the other keys, nothing is showing. So we can go ahead and do the same thing 
for our other keys, at least the one where we want to go to the right. So that's going to be our D key. All I'm going to do to replicate this is I'm going to copy this case statement, paste it, and then say instead of listening for A, we want to listen for D, and console log out, that this means we're going to the right. So on save and refresh, I go to the right, we console log out right, I go to the left, we console log out to the left. So we might want one more key, and that is going to be our space bar for when we actually shoot projectiles. So what should we be listening for when we press space? I'm not even completely sure myself off the top of my head, but if we ever need to know exactly what the string is going to be, we can simply console log out, key, save and refresh, hit space, make sure you select your canvas, and then hit space. And you're going to see that nothing is there. We actually just have a little space string. So in order to reference this, I can go ahead and get our case, paste a new one out like so. And then instead of referencing just D, I just want to hit space. And now we should be listening for no other than space. So on refresh, if I hit space, make sure you select your canvas. I'm just going to go ahead and delete this text. So I stopped doing that. Go ahead and select your canvas and hit space. You're going to see we're console logging out space A and D. Perfect. So now we can go ahead and get rid of key and we get the exact same results. So we know we need to move our player, but how do we actually do that when we hit something like A? Well, we're going to call it right here, and we need to add some sort of velocity onto our player when this is pressed. So we have our velocity set right here, but our player isn't being affected by this velocity at all. In order to have our player affected by this, we want to add one more method within our player class. This is going to be called update. So here, I want to go ahead and say for every time we call update, for every frame, I want to call this draw method right here, which is going to draw out our image. And then I want to go ahead and affect our position on the X axis. And what do I want to affect it by? Well, no other than this dot velocity dot X. So we're going to be adding our X velocity onto our player's X position every time we call update. But instead of calling dot draw on our player within the animate loop, we can go ahead and call dot update instead, because that is going to call this dot draw and then it's going to affect our position by whatever our velocity is. So save and refresh, and now we have some sort of error here. It says, cannot read properties of undefined, and when we click on this, you'll see on line 43, you'll see we are trying to reference this.position.x, but this.position.x isn't declared until our image actually loads. So what we can do is we can go ahead and cut this line right here, this conditional that says if our image is ready, then, we want to go ahead and call all of this code with an update, including this dot draw, which is this right here. So I want to go ahead and wrap all of this within this dot image, save and refresh, go back to console, no more errors. So we're in the clear there, but now we can go back to where we are keying down. And when we hit left right here, I want to go ahead and select our player, get their velocity on the X axis, set it equal to negative five to start. So if I go ahead and save, refresh and hit my A key, You'll see our player goes to the left, but when I lift up on the A key, well, we're not stopping like we should be. So we could go ahead and add a key up event listener to stop this, but I don't really like using key up events because we might be hitting our D key to go right before we actually want to stop. And if we were to lift up on any key, well, we'd force our player to stop anyways. So what I like doing instead is I like creating some sort of keys constant. So I'm going to create a constant called keys on line 50. This is going to be equal to an object that monitors all the keys I want to monitor, right? So what key do we want to monitor? Well, we want to monitor our A key. So I'm going to go ahead and set A right here. It's going to be equal to another object with a property of pressed. And by default, this is going to be equal to false. What other keys do we want to monitor? I'm going to go ahead and copy this property and paste it in. But rather than monitor A, I want to monitor D. And then I want to do the same thing for space. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new one, but instead of D, I'm just going to go ahead and put space in here. We're not actually going to go ahead and use space in this tutorial, but it will be available for the premium tutorial. So let me go ahead and just prime you guys up by adding space in here as well. So now that we have this keys object, whenever we press down A, we can set our keys dot A dot pressed equal to true. We can do the same thing for D. So when D is pressed, then we're going to go ahead and set keys.d.press equal to true. So now that we have these in place within our animate loop, we can go ahead and say if keys.a is pressed, meaning we're going to the left, what do we want to do? Well, we want to go ahead and set our player velocity x equal to negative five. I'm going to cut this line out right here, paste it in. But if this key is not pressed, 
I want to go ahead and select our player velocity on the x-axis and set it equal to zero. So for every frame, we're going to be monitoring whether or not the A key is actually pressed. And if it is not, we're setting our player velocity to zero, which means we are no longer moving. So on save and refresh, we hit A. And when I pick up, well, why did that not work? Well, we have no section in which we are actually setting keys.a.pressed equal to false. It's only set to false by default, but we need to monitor when we pick up specifically on the A key only, we wanna go ahead and set this equal to false. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this event listener, paste it down below, and then say, instead of listening for key down, I wanna listen for key up. So all we're going to do here is we're going to set both of these trues to false. That's all we need to do. You can keep everything else, save and refresh. And now when I go to the left, hit A and pick up, we stop, which is perfect. That is exactly what we want. But when I'm hitting D, we are not going to the right. So what we want to do is within this if statement we just created, we want to go ahead and add an if else, like so. So if else what? We want to say if else our keys dot D is pressed then what do we want to do? We want to go ahead and set our player velocity on the x-axis equal to five, meaning we are going to be going to the right. So if I save all of this now, and it looks like I have a small error here, this is actually an else if, just got this confused real quick, save and refresh, and I hit D on the keyboard, we go to the right, and when I pick up, we stop. Same deal when I go to the left, pick up, stop, push down, pick up, stop. So one quick thing here is you'll notice if I go all the way to the left, well, we can push our player off the screen. We want to go ahead and restrict our player's movement so it can't go off the screen to avoid projectiles. So in order to do this, all we have to do is focus in on this if statement we just created, the very first one. We know when we're pressing A, we're going to the left. So we also want to say, and if our player dot position dot X. So the left side of our player we want to go to the left only if this left side is greater than or equal to no other than zero. So if I go ahead and refresh with that and I go to the left, can no longer go past the left side of the screen. But if I go to the right, well, we can go back to the right. Now we just want to do the same thing for the right side. Now the right side deals with this else if statement right here. So when we're pressing down the D key and our player position dot X, which is the left side of our player, plus player dot width, which means we are getting the right side of our player. We only want to go to the right if the right side of our player is less than or equal to our canvas dot width. So the right side of the screen. So now if I go ahead and save and refresh, we go to the left, stop over there. And if I go to the right, we stop over there as well. Can no longer go past that side. If you want to go ahead and speed up your player, you can simply change this value. Instead of five, we can reference something like seven. You can even be a little more descriptive and create a constant called speed. And just go ahead and reference from one place. I think this is fine for now. I'm just going to go ahead and change that. We have a much faster player. But if we looked within the example over here, you're going to notice that our player actually rotates and turns as we move. We want to add that effect as well. So in order to add that effect into our game, we want to go ahead and say, well, when we're pressing down our A key, that our player dot rotation should be equal to a very small radian number. I want to go ahead and say we should start out with 0.15. That should tilt us to the right actually by a little bit, I believe. I'm going to go ahead and make this negative so we go to the left. I believe that should tilt us to the left. But this player dot rotation property right here, we never actually declared it within our player class. So we need to go back to player and add in a property called this dot rotation. We're going to set it equal to zero because we don't want our player to rotate by default. So I'll save and refresh, nothing going to happen because we need to tell our canvas how to rotate our image using the rotation property that we just created. So rotating things in canvas is always a pain in the butt. There's no good API method to just rotate some sort of image. So here's how we're going to do it. Within our draw function for our player, I'm going to go ahead and call C dot save. And then at the end of C dot draw image, I'm going to call C dot restore. What do these two functions do? Well, they're going to create basically a snapshot in time in which we can translate our canvas. Our canvas, when we wrote, when we call C dot rotate on our canvas, it's going to rotate our canvas from the very top left hand corner of the screen. So if I were to rotate this, we would just start spinning our whole canvas instead of just spinning our player down here. What we need to do is we need to take a snapshot of the current moment in time and then translate our canvas to the very middle of our player. Once we translate it to the middle of our player, 
That is where we are going to call c.rotate to move our canvas, and it's going to rotate our player at the same time. A little confusing, it kind of sucks, I know, but this is the way you have to do it within Canvas. So with c.save and c.restore, we know this is where our snapshot is. We need to move this top left hand corner to the middle of our player. So what I want to do is I want to select c.translate to begin moving our canvas. And where do I want to move this to? Well, simply our player.position.x and then our player.position.y. So that's going to move our canvas right here to the top left-hand corner of our player, but we want to make sure that it's in the middle of our player, not the corner. So to get the middle of our player, I want to go ahead back to our x value and add on our player.width divided by two. And when we add on our player width divided by two from this side right here, we're going to be put directly in the center of our player on the x axis. We want to do the same thing for the y axis. So I'm going to go ahead and add on player.height divided by two. Now we're going to be within the center of our player. So now that I went ahead and translated our canvas, I can go ahead and call c.rotate. What do I want to rotate by? Well, whatever this dot rotation is set to at any point in time. So if I call this dot rotation, it's going to go ahead and rotate our player, but now we need to move our canvas back to its original spot. Believe me, I know this is tedious in order to just rotate something, but it's how we're going to have to deal with it. So in order to move it back, we just want to select this c.translate code, paste it below, and we're just going to go ahead and set these to negative values. So we're going to move back by our player position.x minus the player width divided by two and minus our player height divided by two. So when we save that and refresh, when I go to the right, well, we don't see any rotation, but when I go to the left, our player is now rotated to the left. So this code right here works within draw. We no longer need to touch this, but we do need to go down where we are setting our player rotation. So when we hit left, we're going to the left, we're rotating to the left at least by 0.15. But when we go to the right, we want to rotate by 15. So we're moving player.rotation equal to 0.15 positive right here whenever we press down the D key. And then finally, when nothing is pressed, if we don't want to be stuck in this position, we want to set player.rotation equal to no other than zero. So on refresh, I go to the right, we rotate to the right, I go to the left, we rotate to the left, everything is looking good, and then finally, when I stop, we go back to our original position. So we are looking to be in great shape for our player movement, so if I go on over to to-dos, we successfully moved the player. So now we're going to go ahead and shoot projectiles from the player. Things are starting to get a lot more fun. So how do we go ahead and create projectiles? Well, within index.js, I want to go right beneath our player class, so right here, go to the very bottom, and I want to create a new class called projectile. So we're going to have a constructor method inside of here, and let's think, what kind of properties should a projectile have? Well, they're going to be moving across the screen, so we're going to have a position, and they're going to be set dynamically based on wherever the player is. And if anything is set dynamically, you want to pass it through as a constructor argument. So whenever I pass through my constructor arguments now, I like using one default object so I can specify what the name is of what I want to pass through. So I'm going to pass through a position eventually. And then I'm going to say this uh, position should be equal to the position I'm passing through. I also know our projectiles are going to move. Whenever something moves, you're going to have some sort of velocity. So this dot velocity is going to be equal to a velocity that I'm passing through. This way, I can have different velocities based on whether or not I have a power up or whether or not the game continues onwards with time. This allows me to vary things up a bit. And our projectiles are going to be circular, so they're going to have some sort of radius associated with them. By default, I'm just going to say three. I'm not going to make this dynamic. I think static is fine for now. And I think that's all we need to get started. So let's go ahead and create our draw function to determine what a projectile looks like. We are going to go ahead and call c.beginPath, which is needed to call c arc. So what is c.arc? Well, it's just a method that's going to create an arc and we're going to use it to create a full circular arc to basically create a circle. There's no circle method within canvas, so we're using this instead. What arguments does it take? Well, to start, it takes an x, a y, and a radius. So we want to reference this dot position dot x for x position, and then this dot position dot y for y. Our radius should be this dot radius, we're referencing this right here, and now it takes a start angle and end angle and counterclockwise, which isn't even required actually. So the start angle is going to be zero. This is a radians value. Where should our arc start? 
our next value is going to be where our arc ends. So if you're new to radians, to get a full circle, we want to reference math.pi times 2 radians. And that is all we need to create a full circle with c.arc. So if we want to go ahead and fill this in, we can call c.fill. And if we want to specify what color should this be, we can call c.fill style, capital S, equal to red. And then we want to go ahead and close this path. So c.close path like so. So that determines what our projectile is going to look like, and we know our projectiles are going to move, so I want to add in an update method as well. So within update, I'm going to call this dot draw to render out our image, and then I'm going to start moving things with this dot position dot x, and say it should be affected by this dot velocity dot x. Same thing for our y position. This is just some basic code for adding on velocity onto our projectiles. And it looks like our projectile blueprint is good to go. So now if I want to create multiple projectiles on our screen, instead of just storing them within one singular constant like so, I'm going to create a new constant called projectiles. And this is going to be equal to an empty array to start. And now whatever projectiles within this array, we need to actually animate and render out on the screen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say projectiles for each projectile within our projectiles array. We have a little arrow function right here. We wanna say what to do with each of these projectiles. All we wanna do is select the projectile, which we are passing through right here, and then call their update function. So we're going to be calling this right here for each projectile. We save and refresh. Well, no projectiles on the screen, but we can go ahead and create one ourselves just to make sure that it's being rendered out. To create one, I'm going to go inside of our projectiles array, and hit new, projectile. And now we know this takes one argument, which is going to be an object, but within this object we require two properties. We have a position property equal to an object with an x and a y, because we're using those right here. So x is going to be equal to, let's just say 300, y will be equal to 300, spawn it somewhere over here, 300. And then we have a velocity. So velocity is going to be equal to an object with an x and a y. We can set these both equal to zero to start so it doesn't move. On save and refresh, now we have our one projectile rendered out on the screen. And with this code right here within our update function, it should move if we change our velocity equal to something other than zero. So we set this equal to five. You're going to see it starts moving off the right side of the screen. We set our y to five instead of x. Well, now it's going to be moving downwards. We should probably set this equal to negative five because that is where we're going to be shooting our enemies. So we know this renders out and moves correctly. So we no longer want one projectile spawned by default. We can go ahead and cut this new projectile code and now think to ourselves, where do we want to spawn our projectiles? Well, we want to spawn them whenever we hit spacebar on our keyboard. Where are we tracking for that? Well, no other than the event listener right here for key down in the space case. So here is where we're going to be pushing in projectiles to our projectiles array. And as soon as we push them in, that is what's going to cause our projectiles to move upwards on the screen. Well, not upwards just yet, but it's going to cause them to be spawned on the screen. So I'm going to go ahead and select our project tiles array. And I want to push in that new projectile that we created originally. So I'm just going to go ahead and paste that in there. And now on save and refresh, if I hit space, well, it's going to be spawned from this one location whenever I hit space on the keyboard. So obviously I want these spawned from a different location. I want them spawned from wherever our player is on the screen. How do we do that? Well, where we are specifying our position right here, instead of referencing a static value like 300, I can reference our player position dot X. And then same thing for Y. I want to start off with player position dot Y. That's really all it takes. It's really cool. So I go ahead and save and refresh and then hit space. We are now spawning projectiles from wherever our player is, but obviously you'll notice they're not coming from the center. So we need to take that into account. Our X and Y start at the top left-hand corner of our image. We want to add on our player dot width divided by two. That's going to put us right in the center on the X axis. And I think position Y is actually in a good location because that's the top of our image and that's where we want projectiles to spawn. So we can leave that as is. So let's save and refresh. Now when I hit space, they are coming from the center of our player. The only thing I want to change here is these projectiles are kind of slow for my liking. I'm just going to go ahead and turn up their velocity to negative 10. Save and refresh. And I really like the way that it's looking. Maybe I'll turn them up later, but we are in great shape for creating projectiles. So before we go ahead and check this off within to do, I want to go ahead and console log out our projectiles array right whenever we are pressing space. And I'm going to go ahead and comment out all these other console logs just so we have a clean console. 
and I can just monitor our projectiles. So I'll go ahead and comment those out, refresh, and now you'll see when I hit space, we push one projectile under the ray. We just had one shoot up. When I hit a lot more, well, you'll see we still have 10 projectiles in the ray, even though none are showing on the screen. And just to prove this to you, if I hit space one more time, well, we have 11 now, even though I just shot one. We want to go ahead and do garbage collection for these projectiles so that when they go off the screen, we remove them from our game altogether. And that way we're not calling any render or update function on top of them, which is going to slow down our game. So in order to make sure that these are removed, as soon as they go off the top of our screen, we're going to want to focus on where we are updating our projectiles, which is going to be right here within our animate loop. So here I can add in an if statement that says if our projectile position dot y plus our projectile dot radius. So the bottom of our projectile is less than or equal to zero, meaning it is off the top of the screen. Then I want to go ahead and call projectiles. So select our projectiles array dot splice. I want to take this one projectile out of our array, remove it from the scene altogether whenever it goes off the top of our screen. Now this takes a start and a delete count. Start just means index. What is the index of the current projectile we want to remove? Well, we can get this index directly using for each. It provides index for us as the second argument next to projectile. So if I go ahead and add a comma here, I can go ahead and add in an index argument like so. And now I can reference this and say, I want to splice out the projectile at this specific index. And I only want to splice out one from that one index. And if these are still on the screen, we're going to add in an else statement that says we should be updating our projectile otherwise. So now on save and refresh, if I go ahead and start hitting space, you're going to see eventually they all go off the screen. But if I hit space again, we only have one projectile because we removed all the others using this simple statement. Now, later on, when we shoot a lot of projectiles, you might notice some of the projectiles flashing using projectiles that splice. An easy way to fix this before anything even happens, before we even deal with the bug, is we can write set time out, which takes an arrow function. And inside of this arrow function, we can call projectiles.splice. And we just want to go ahead and add zero, comma zero at least, to the end of this arrow function as the second argument within set timeout to say we want basically one additional frame before we splice this out, and that is going to prevent any flashing from occurring on the screen. So if I go ahead and save and refresh, everything should still work as expected. They are all spliced out perfectly, even with set timeout zero, but we're going to prevent that flash from happening. So I'm going to go ahead, comment out, console log projectiles, go back to to do. And now I'm going to go ahead and check off create projectiles. That is how we're going to create projectiles for our game. Okay, so let's go ahead and create our invader. So we're going to create some sort of enemy on the screen. And the very first thing we're going to do to do this is, well, we're going to transfer over some sort of invader image. Now, this image that I have for me is going to be within my downloads folder, within untitled folder 127. You can find this within the description of the video. And here it is. It's going to be invader.png. This is simply the default invader emoji that comes with things such as iMessage. I just transferred this over to XD and exported it as a PNG. So we should be able to use it wherever we want. And now that this is within my downloads folder, I want to switch it on over to our project folder within space dash invaders. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and drag invader.png into our image folder up above like so and now that it's inside of there I can go back to our project and I should be able to import it into our game when we're ready but before we actually do that we need to go ahead and create an invader class so an invader is going to have a velocity it's going to have an image it makes sense to take what we have right here for player and to just copy and paste it and create an invader out of that that way we don't have to rewrite this whole thing so i'm going to go ahead and copy our player class and i'm going to put this beneath our projectile as the next class in line and i'm going to rename our class not player but invader makes sense so instead of referencing a spaceship for our invaders i want to go ahead and reference our invader.png which is right here within our image folder so we don't need to change much just the name of the file and then let's go ahead and look at our on load do we want to scale this down well we don't actually need a scale i believe because i think i exported this at the exact size we needed at so what we can do is we can either set scale to one 
and then scale it down later, or we can just go ahead and delete scale. I'm going to go ahead and set it to one. I think that makes sense. And then for position, well, we're going to do this dynamically, but for now, let's go ahead and get it somewhere within the center of our game over here. So for our X, this is actually going to center it directly in the middle of the screen. This is great. We don't need to change our position for X, but for Y, if we spawn it where it is right now, it's going to spawn somewhere down here. We want it in the middle of our screen. So let's just go ahead and say this should be canvas height divided by two, and that should get it close enough to the middle of the screen where we want it. So we have our invader class, we have a position for it, we have an image, a width and a height that's automatically loaded from the image. We have a draw function as well. Now this draw function right here is taking into account rotation code. Does an invader actually have rotation associated with it? Well, it might if your game wants it, but in this game, I don't think it needs it. So I'm going to go ahead and actually remove this dot rotation from our constructor property. And I'm also going to go ahead and remove any rotate code that we have within our draw function here. So everything, right above draw image from C save down to C translate. I'm going to delete and I'm also going to delete C dot restore since we don't have an associated save anymore. We don't need it. So everything else seems to be okay, but we know an invader is going to be traveling downwards on the screen. So we want to make sure that we're not just moving the invaders X position, but we're also moving the invaders Y position with its Y velocity. So I think with this, we have a complete invader class. Let's go ahead and test this out. So to create invaders on the screen, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead, create a const called invader. I'm just going to go ahead and create one for now to make this easy. This is going to be equal to a new invader. Let's go ahead and see what this takes. We can look at our constructor argument. It does not take anything. We're just going to spawn this in one spot. So we don't need to actually pass anything through here, but we do need to call invader Dot update to make sure that it's rendered out on the screen within our animate loop. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call that right after c.fill rect. I'm going to call invader.update and hopefully this renders out correctly on the screen. So I'm going to save and refresh and there is our invader. That is all we need to get started with our invader, get rendered out on the screen. But before we actually get into any collision detection with our projectiles right here, I wanna go ahead and create a grid of invaders similar to the classic game. So we just don't have one to shoot at, we have many and they're going to be spawning at different rates and have a different amount of them as rows and columns. So if we look over at our to-do list here, we created an invader, we can go ahead and check that off. But now we need to create and move grids of invaders. So we're going to go ahead and create this invaders grid. How do we do that? Well, if we think about this, we could go ahead and create an array of invaders and then lay them out manually based on that array. But I think it makes more sense to create something like a grid class and have that grid class actually contain all the invaders for that one grid. And based off that one grid's positioning, we're going to move the position of every invader inside of it. Might sound a little confusing right now, but I promise this is going to make sense. So in order to start creating this grid, we'll open up our project and right below our invader class, we're going to create one more class. This is going to be a grid class. So let's go ahead and create a constructor and a grid is going to have a position. So we wanna go ahead and declare this dot position is equal to an X. We're going to set it equal to zero to start and y set it equal to zero to start as well and our grid is also going to have some sort of movement associated with it whenever you have movement what property do we use no other than this dot velocity we're going to have one for x and y because our grid is going to be moving on the x and the y axis so our x is going to be equal to zero and our y is going to be equal to zero and now as i mentioned each grid is going to have an array of invaders we're going to be creating multiple grids which contain multiple rows and columns of different invaders so here i'm going to create this dot invaders this is going to be equal to an array and we're going to populate this array for each grid that we create using this constructor method so the very first thing we're going to do is render out our invaders for each grid. We're currently rendering out just one invader, but we wanna go ahead and create a grid, instantiate some sort of invader within this invaders array, and then get it rendered out just to start. So what I'm going to do is where we just created our invader, right here, I'm going to go ahead and cut out new invader, delete this const invader right here, and I'm going to paste that new invader within our new invaders array. So whenever we create a grid, we are creating a new invader and storing it within the grid's invaders array. So how do we actually render this out on the screen? I'm going to go ahead and first delete invader.update right here, save and refresh. You'll see our invader is gone. So now we need a place to actually store our grids. So then we can render out our invaders. So I'm going to go ahead and create a const, call it grids because we're going to have multiple of these. 
Now I'm going to create an array so we can store multiple grids. So how do we render out the invaders within the grid we're about to create? Let's create the grid first. Within this grids array, I'll go ahead and create one with new grid. This doesn't take any constructor arguments. We can go ahead and leave it empty for now. But now that we have a grid within our grids array, we can go ahead and say, we want to select our grids within our animate loop. And for each grid that we are selecting, we want to go ahead and call an arrow function and call grid dot update. What is grid dot update going to do? Well, nothing because we don't have an update function in place, but let's go ahead and create one. Let's go ahead and put update right here within grid, leave it empty to start. But what is update going to do here? Well, if we look with an update, we don't have anything. So if we save and refresh, our invader within the invaders array is not showing. How do we actually render out the invaders? Well, instead of calling just grid dot update here, what I can do is I can select grid dot invader. So all the invaders within our grid and I can run dot for each invader within our invaders array within the grid. Then I want to call invader dot update, which is going to render out the invader on the screen. So save and refresh. You're going to see our invader is in place once more, but this time we are rendering out using grids, which is going to be required to create multiple rows and columns of enemies. So that is going to bring us to the next part. How do we create multiple rows and columns of our invaders next to each other? Well, we are going to want to use a for loop within our grid constructor. So right below where we are declaring this dot invaders, I can go ahead and create a for loop with for let i, that is going to be our iterator, set it equal to zero to start. And then we want to run this, let's just say 10 times. This is going to be our column. So we're going to create 10 columns of invaders. And then we want to iterate once for each call of this for loop. So now that this is going to run 10 times, instead of just creating a new invader by default, like we are right here, we can go ahead and cut this out. We could call this dot invaders within our for loop and then push in a new invader. So this is going to create 10 invaders and we can console log this out. This dot invaders, just to make sure it's actually doing that refresh and you'll see 10 invaders are there, but they're all stacked on top of each other. Why? Because their position is going to be the same. If we look within our invader class right here, you're going to see the position is default canvas width divided by two and also canvas height divided by two. This means if we want our invaders to have a different position, what do we need? Well, we need to pass through some sort of argument here within our constructor function. So I can go ahead and create an empty object. And then inside of this, I want to say, I want to pass through a position object. So I'll just declare position right here. And instead of referencing X statically, like we are right now, I can go ahead and say, we want to reference position X. And then we want to reference position dot y. So now wherever we are actually creating an invader, we need to make sure we're passing through some sort of position. So the one place we know we're creating it is within our grid right here. And we're creating a new invader for each time we run through this for loop. So we need to pass through a position, which is going to be equal to an object with an x and a y. So if I put x zero to start, just to get something there and y zero to start, everything's going to spawn up here in the top left corner, which it does. But we want to make sure that our invaders are all spawned next to each other in some sort of column-like format. So what we could do is we can go ahead and say that our x should be equal to i, the iterator, for every time we go through this for loop. So when we go through this for the first time, i is going to be equal to zero. We're just going to put it up here. But as we continue through this for loop, i is going to increase. So the next loop is going to be equal to one. It's going to push it over to the right a little bit. But if we save it with just x equal to i, you're going to see these are still way too close to each other. We need to multiply this iterator by the width of the image of the actual invader. So the width of the image I know is going to be 30, 30 pixels wide. If I go ahead and save and refresh that, well now all of these are placed perfectly next to each other. So that's going to take care of how we create invaders in a column-like format, but what if we want to create invaders in a row-like format, get some beneath the current row we have right now? Well to do this, we're going to want to create another for loop within this for loop. So to do this quickly, we can go ahead and copy this first for loop line, paste it right below, and then make sure we are adding an ending curly bracket. And it should look something like this. Now, this isn't going to work by default because this for loop has the same iterator value as the one above. We want to go ahead and make sure that we are changing the second iterator value. So instead of just calling these i, which is typical for iterator or index, whatever you want to call it, we can go ahead and say that this is going to be equal to y. So where is this position on the y axis? This is going to be our y iterator. Make sure you are changing i with y for the second loop. And it makes a little more sense for the first loop since the first loop deals with our columns that we call this x 
instead of just i. So instead of multiplying i by 30 here, we're going to multiply x by 30, and then we're going to do the exact same thing for our y. We're going to go ahead and multiply our y value, which is given to us from our for loop here. We're going to multiply it by the height of the image, which is also going to be 30, I believe. Let's hope I'm right. Let's go ahead and save and refresh. And now these are laid out in a perfect grid-like format. Awesome. So this is obviously a lot of rows for our invaders. Why? Because when this starts actually moving across the screen and they start coming closer to us, well, there's not a lot of time to get rid of these invaders on the bottom. It might be a little too hard to start. So what we can do is we can limit the amount of rows that we're running through this for loop for. So right above our for loop, I'm going to create a const called rows. And this is going to be equal to a random value because what if I want the rows to be dynamic? What if sometimes these spawn I want to have two rows, sometimes four, just have it completely random to make the game more interesting? Well, in order to make this random for our row count, I can call math.random, which is going to give us any value, zero to one by default, and then multiply it by a value like five. So this is going to give us any value between zero and five. But if we were to actually use rows right here, we would make we would need to make sure that this is a whole number, an integer. So to do that, well, we want to go ahead and say math.floor. We are getting the floor value of math.random times 5. So if we get something like 2.5, it's going to floor it down to 2. If we get something like 2.7, it's going to go back down to 2. Give us two rows. So if we were to use this within our for loops here to get the correct amount of rows, we can go ahead and replace our y10 right here with rows instead. And then refresh. You're going to see here we got two rows. Keep refreshing to get a different amount of rows. And you might want more rows than this. Let's say we want anywhere from two to seven rows. In order for that to happen, we can just go ahead and add the value two onto our equation right here. So this says if we get a value zero right here from math random times five, well, we're always going to have a minimum of two rows because we're adding two onto that value. But if we get a value of five from math.random times five, well, we're going to get seven rows because we're adding on two. So we're getting any value two to seven here. It's going to make our game a lot more fun, a lot more enjoyable to play. So if I save and refresh that, you'll see we're getting any amount of rows from two to around six, seven. So we can also do the same thing for our columns. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy and paste this line, but call this columns. Instead, I'm actually going to move this above our rows because we're dealing with columns first here. And I actually want more columns than rows here because the rows are going to make our game a lot harder when they get closer to our player. So let's go ahead and say, instead of five columns, I want to go ahead and get anywhere from zero to 10 columns. But I want to make sure that I have a minimum of one, two, three, four, five invaders in place for our columns. So I'm going to add five onto the end of this. Then I could select our columns constant and replace this default 10 with no other than columns. So now on save and refresh, we get a random amount of columns and also rows. So now that we have this generation complete, how do we actually move our invaders side to side? Well, we're going to want to go ahead and use our update function here. We're going to use some typical velocity code by saying this dot position dot x should have our velocity added onto it. So this dot velocity dot x for our x axis. And we want to do the same thing for our y axis because we know our invaders are going to move down as well as side to side. So I'm going to go ahead and replace x with y for both of these. And then I can go ahead and set our default velocity on the x axis equal to three, which should push our grid to the right. So if I save and refresh that, our grid is actually moving to the right, but our invaders are not because they're not affected by the grid velocity, well, the grid position to be exact. So if I wanna go ahead and make our invaders affected by the grid position within our invaders update function. So we find our class of invader, we go down to update, we wanna pass through some sort of velocity here. So we're going to create an object with a velocity property and say that our invaders velocities should be equal to what we're passing through right here, not the velocity that would be assigned to each invader by default. So I'm going to get rid of this dot for our velocities right here and right here, because now we're referencing a velocity we're passing through update. But now wherever we are calling invader.update, we can search for invader dot update this is going to be within our animation loop right here we need to make sure we're passing through a velocity so we know each grid we're currently looping over right here has some sort of velocity associated with it so i can go ahead and say right here with an update that our invader velocity should be equal to our grids velocity the grid that we're currently looping over so if i go ahead and save that and then refresh 
All of our invaders are going to move to the right because they are controlled by our grid's velocity, which is set to go to the right. So when our grid goes all the way to the right, how do we get it to bounce off that side of the screen and go back? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead back up to where we are using update within our grid class. And here, what we can do is we can say if our grid position, so this dot position dot X, so we're getting the left side of our grid and we want to get the right side. So whenever we want to get the right side, we can say this dot width, add on the width of the grid. That's going to give us the right side of the grid over here. If this, the right side of the grid is greater than or equal to what? Well, our canvas dot width. So the right side of our canvas over here, then what do we want to happen? Well, we want to go ahead and select our velocity on the x-axis and simply set it to a negative value of this dot velocity dot x. So on save and refresh, they go to the right, and it looks like they keep going. So what is going on here? Well, the issue is we're referencing this dot width, but if we look up here, we never actually declared a width property for our grid. So we need to make sure we're doing that based on the amount of invaders we have within our grid in the first place. So right below where we are declaring our columns and rows, I can go ahead and say this dot width is equal to our columns because our columns are going to determine our overall width times what? Well, the width of each actual invader, which is going to be 30. So that should give us the full width of the actual grid. Let's go ahead and save and refresh and see if this works now. Goes to the right, and eventually it does bounce off the right side of the screen, but you'll see it goes all the way back to the left because we never actually wrote a conditional for the left side of the screen. So we also want to reverse our velocity when all of our invaders, the left side of the grid, hits the left side of our canvas. So we can go ahead and add an OR statement right here. And then we're going to say if this dot position dot x, so the left side of our grid is less than or equal to zero, we want to call the same code. That's all we have to do. So now if we go ahead, save and refresh, it's going to bounce off the right side of the screen, and then it's going to bounce off the left side of the screen like so. So now that these are bouncing perfectly side to side, each time they bounce, we want to make sure that we lower them so they start getting closer and closer to our player makes the game harder to play, and then eventually once they reach our player, our player should explode. So in order to do this, it's really simple. Within this if statement we created, when we hit a side over here, we also want to push our invaders down. We want to push our grid down by 30 pixels, the exact height of one of these invaders. So what we want to say is our velocity on the y-axis should be equal to 30 whenever we hit a side. Save and refresh and our invaders go way off the screen. So we're setting our grid's velocity on the y-axis to 30, which is going to push everything down, of course. But the issue is it's maintaining this velocity of 30. So instead of saying that for every frame, the velocity should be 30, what we're going to do is we're going to set this dot velocity on the y-axis for our grid equal to zero for every frame. And then if this condition is actually true, we're going to set it equal to 30. So it is going to have one frame in which it pushes everything down by 30, but then it's just going to go straight back to zero and it's going to stay at zero until this if statement actually goes through. So if I save and refresh that, we should get the desired effect. Let's go ahead and see. We hit the side and indeed it is pushed down for that one frame. We reset it back to zero. So it doesn't keep going down like it was earlier. So if we look within our to-do, we can go ahead and check off create and move grids of invaders. Next up, we want to go ahead and spawn these grids at intervals so we don't have just one boring game where we get rid of this grid and we win. We want to go ahead and make sure that this is an infinite game where we keep spawning different rows and columns of invaders to keep the game interesting. So in order to spawn grids at intervals, here's what we're going to do. Right above our anime loop here, I want to create a let called frames and set it equal to zero. So now that I have this frames let available at the very bottom of our animate loop, right here, I can add one onto frames, which means that we just went through one loop of our animation. So now that I have frames available to us, I can go inside of our animate loop, right above frames actually, I could say if our frames are divisible by some sort of number. So let's say I want to spawn a grid of enemies for every thousandth frame. I can say if frames is divisible by a thousand, and set that equal to zero, which means it's divisible by a thousand, then what do I want to do? Well, I want to go ahead and select our grids object and push in a new grid. So let's go ahead and see what that looks like. If I save and refresh, eventually when our frames hits 1000, we see a new grid spawned. We should see another because frames is going to be added onto each other. I don't see one just yet. That's okay. We can go ahead and console log out frames to make sure that this is working as expected. So right here, I'll just console log out frames. 
save and refresh you're going to see this is our frames over here. So once we hit 1,000, we should actually see a new one. For some reason, we're getting two in there. We'll go ahead and debug that soon. But once we hit frame 1,000, you'll see right now we just created a new grid that's completely randomized because we told our grid class to do that. So why do we have two grids spawned by default? Let's see where we are creating our grids. So we're saying grids should be equal to new grid right here. But by default, actually, frames divided by a thousand if frames is equal to zero and we divide it by a thousand it's going to be equal to well zero so by default the very first frame of our game we're already pushing through a new grid so it's totally okay for us to get rid of that default grid up here and just use this interval function to spawn enemies instead so if i go ahead and save and refresh we only have one spawn now but eventually once we hit a thousand over here we're going to get another spawn and you'll see now that this hits 1000 we have another grid of enemies and we can begin trying to destroy both grids now it might get a little boring to keep spawning enemies for every 1000 frames instead you can go ahead and make this value right here random so we can go ahead and select math.random and multiply it by something like 500 so we're saying spawn an enemy for every zero to 500 frames. Well, that's way too little. So what we wanna do is we wanna make sure we spawn an enemy, not for a zero to 500, but rather 500 to 1000. So in order to do that, we're going to go ahead and add 500 onto this function right here. So now if we get a value of zero from this, we can add up 500. We're saying we have a default minimum of 500 frames to spawn a new grid. But if we get the top value right here with this equation of 500, we add on another 500 and that's going to give us 1000. So we can go ahead and save and refresh and watch what happens well nothing's actually being spawned because this value right here keeps changing for every frame of our animation we want to make sure we only set this once and then we only reset it if this value is equal to true in the first place so i want to go ahead and get this equation out of here and i'm going to put it outside of our animation loop i'm going to call this a let random interval set it equal to this equation and it looks like i grabbed the next for parentheses we can just go ahead and take this out grab random interval copy it and then say if frames is divisible by random interval like so make sure you get rid of this early parentheses in the beginning which i forgot to delete then what do we want to do we want to push through a new grid so if we save and refresh it's still kind of going to work but let's go ahead and console log out random interval in the first place so console dot log random interval if i go in and console log this out well if we look at the very top we get a number of 557.301 so if we are thinking to ourselves, eventually frames is going to be some higher number and it's always going to be a whole number. Well, frames is never going to be divisible by this random interval simply because it has a bunch of float values associated with it. So we need to make sure that we're wrapping this whole thing in a math.floor function to make sure we get an integer instead of some sort of decimal. So now we always get some sort of integer, as you can see right there. So if we refresh, you'll see right here, our next enemy should be respawned at 508, 508 frames. So if I try to scroll this all the way back down and catch up with everything else, we just hit 508. So we spawned some new enemies. And then we need to make sure that this random interval is regenerated whenever we spawn those new enemies. Otherwise, our interval is always going to be 508. So what I can do is I can grab this random interval is equal to code. And then within our if statement, wherever we are spawning enemies, go ahead and comment this out, spawning enemies. If we spawn a new grid, I can go ahead and reset our random interval to a new one, and therefore we will get enemies spawned at completely different rates. So let's go ahead and console log random interval within this if statement right here. I'll save and refresh. So our first enemy is going to be spawned by default at zero, and then our next one is going to be spawned at 910 frames, and then our next one is going to be spawned at 841 frames. Now, something important here to note is we might get some values as frames keep increasing, in which frames it's divisible by either of these numbers. If that's the case, we just need to make sure we're setting frames equal to zero each time we call random interval right here. I know the first time we go through this, when frames is equal to zero, this actually works, but the thing is we're adding one onto frames right after this anyways, so it should work without spawning too many grids that we didn't ask for. So our next grid is going to be spawned at 518, and then eventually we should get a new one spawned with a new random interval in which the next one will spawn. So let's go ahead and see. Now our next one should be spawned at 602, and we should have a good rate at which these different grids are spawned for all of our invaders. And that does seem about right. Okay, so great. Let's go back to our to-dos and say that we just spawn grids at intervals. So in order to shoot our invaders, we're going to want to go to where we are actually looping through our invaders. Where is that going to be? Well, it's going to be right here within our grid. 
and for every invader we are updating. So for each invader, we also want to loop through each projectile we are shooting out of our player. So we can go ahead and select all our projectiles like so within this loop. And we want to say for each projectile within our projectiles array, create an arrow function like so. We want to go ahead and detect for collision. So detect for collision, we're going to create an if statement. And now we want to say, well, we only want to remove an invader if the top of our projectile is less than the bottom of one of our invaders. That's going to be the first step. So how do we get the top of one of our projectiles? If we look again, our projectiles are circular and the middle of our projectile is actually where our position is. So if we need to get the top, we need a reference. The projectile we're looping over, make sure that this is singular right here. So it should be projectile, not projectiles. We need to get the position dot y. And then we know since position dot y is the middle of one of our circles, we need to go ahead and subtract the projectile's radius to get the top of it. It's going to give us the top of our projectile. Now we need to say we only want to remove an enemy if this value right here at the top of our projectile is less than or equal to what? Well, our invader dot position dot y plus the invader's height, which is going to give us the bottom of one of our invaders. So now let's go ahead and add some curly brackets here and say if this is true, what do we want to do? Well, we want to call set timeout. We're just going to take an arrow function like so. And here we're going to go ahead and splice out both our invader and the projectile. So I'm going to go ahead and select our invaders first and then say splice. At what index do I want to splice out of? Well, whatever index is provided to us through for each. So I can go ahead and say the index is going to be here. Set that equal to I. So I can say I want to splice out at this index, I, and I only want to splice out one enemy from that index. So now I can do the same thing, not just for invaders, but to also for our projectiles. But I don't want to splice out at the invaders index. I want to splice out at the projectiles index. So here I can add another index and typically I just go through the alphabet for the next index. I'm going to call this J. I want to select a projectile at the J index and remove one from that index point. And then I want to make sure to add a second argument for set timeout, set it equal to zero to prevent any flashes, save and refresh. And now we should start removing some invaders. So on save and refresh, if I start shooting away, well, we're getting the error invaders is not defined at 224. Let's check this out. This is correct. We don't actually have an invaders array, but we do have an invaders array within our grid object right here. So we can go ahead and say, instead of referencing invaders, we want to reference our grid dot invaders and splice out from that instead. So now if I save and refresh and I start shooting, we are starting to remove invaders. Although it's definitely not correct because we need to add a little more collision detection code that says our projectile needs to be in between the left and right side of an invader, not just when it moves past one. So to continue this collision detection code, within this if statement, I'm going to add an and statement. And I wanna to test to make sure that the right side of our projectile is greater than the left side of one of our invaders. So to get the right side of our projectile, I'm going to select our projectile, dot position, dot x, and add on our projectile radius. So that is the right side. And I want to say only remove an enemy if this is greater than or equal to what? Our invader dot position dot x. That's going to give us the left side of an enemy. And now we want to do the same thing for the left side of our projectile. Make sure that it is less than the right side of one of our enemies. So I can add one more and statement and say we want to get the right side of our projectile with projectile dot position dot x minus the radius. So projectile dot radius and we want to say we only want to remove an enemy if this is less than or equal to our invader dot position dot x. So let's go ahead and save, refresh, and see how that works. So now when I shoot, you see we're not removing anything until we hit an enemy directly. And this collision detection code is actually pretty precise, but you'll see some of them are still being removed at the top for some reason. So let's go ahead and just to be safe, we want to go ahead and say, well, a projectile should only remove an enemy if the bottom of a projectile is more than the bottom of an invader. So we'll add one more and statement here that says if our projectile dot position dot y plus our projectile dot radius. So the bottom of our projectile is greater than or equal to our invader dot position dot y. And that should make our collision detection code even more precise, but we're still getting an issue where randomly some of the invaders are being removed from the top, even though we don't get a projectile way up there.
So whenever we are splicing objects out of a parent array, sometimes it goes ahead and tries to splice out a new one because splicing changes the whole format of our array in the first place. So we need to make sure that when we actually call invader splice or projectile splice, that the actual invader or projectile that we're trying to splice out is actually within the array in the first place. So to do this, I'm going to go ahead and create a const within set timeout called invader found. And I'm going to test that invader was actually found by saying, I want to select our grid dot invaders. And I want to go ahead and find an invader. I'm going to call this invader two so it doesn't conflict with this invader up here. Create an arrow function out of this. And I just want to return to test that invader two, the invader I'm looping over within our current version of grid dot invaders actually exists within the parent version of grid dot invaders. So I can go ahead and say if invader two is equal to the invader we're currently looping over right here, then we have found an invader, and then we can go ahead and say if invader was found, then we want to call our splice code for both grid and projectiles. So save and refresh, and we shoot, and some of them are still being removed, unfortunately, and that is because we also need to do the same thing, not just for our invaders, but also for our projectiles. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new constant called projectile found to make sure it actually exists before we call splice. And then I want to go ahead and just say, select our projectiles and then find projectile two, simply so we don't conflict with this projectile we're looping over right here. And then I can do a shorthand version of what we see right here up above. If I want to go ahead and return something, well, I don't actually need the parentheses by default since I'm only calling one line, which is just meant to return. And then I can call find projectile two that is equal to the projectile we're currently looping over. So if the projectile we're trying to remove is actually found, then we want to make sure we remove both. So I can say if invader is found and if projectile is found, then we want to go ahead and call this code. We can even go ahead and refactor invader found up here by removing return, getting rid of the curly brackets. We have a little bit cleaner code for our find statements. So now on save and refresh, we start shooting and well, it almost looks complete. It's definitely a lot more accurate, but we still are getting the issue up here where one is being removed somehow. So we just need to really inspect our collision detection code in this case. But believe me, I promise you everything we did here, this is useful. It's going to occur at some later point in time. If you did not do this, that something is going to be removed randomly. So make sure you have this code in there. So let's just go ahead and inspect our collision detection code here. And it looks like, well, right here for our X axis that for the left side of our particle, I didn't actually make sure that it was monitoring for the right side of our invader. I'm actually just monitoring for the left side of our invader. So it ruins all of our collision detection code altogether. So to fix this right here for invader position X, I just want to go ahead and add on invader dot width to take into account the right side of our invader. So now let's go ahead and save and refresh and try this again. And that seems to have done the trick. We have pretty much near perfect collision detection. And to make this a little more apparent where our projectiles are, I actually wanna go ahead and increase the size of them. So I'm going to find our projectile class, turn up our radius to four to make them a little bigger, save and refresh. And I really like the way that is looking. We now have near perfect collision detection in place. So I'm going to go over to to do and check off shoot invaders. But something you may have noticed now that we can shoot is if I refresh and I wipe out a whole left or right side of one of these grids, well, the grid isn't actually taking into account the new width. You'll see it bounces back before it actually touches the left hand side. So before moving on to invader shoot back, I'm going to add in a new task here called 7a. And here I want to go ahead and take into account new grid width. So to make sure that when we eliminate a column of invaders that our grid is still bouncing all the way to the side, we wanna go all the way back to our code that we just created where we are removing our grid invaders and our projectiles. So we can go ahead and say, remove invader and projectile here for code cleanliness purposes so we know exactly what this does. And now we need to go ahead and determine a new width for our grid whenever we remove an invader or a projectile. So the first thing I want to do is I only want to call the following code if our grid has invaders inside of it. So I'm going to say grid.invaders.length is greater than zero, meaning we have stuff in there. So we populated columns before we went into rows. So what we can do is now that we know our grid invaders length is always greater than zero, we can create a const called first invader and grab the very first invader within the far left hand column with grid.invaders zero. No matter what we remove on the left hand side, it's still always going to give us some invader 
on the farthest left column. So we can do the same thing and grab our last invader as well. But rather than reference zero, we want to go ahead and get our grid dot invaders dot length and subtract one. This is how we're going to get the very last element within the array. So think about it. If we get the far left hand side of our grid over here, because we wiped out a different column of invaders, to recalculate our grid width, all we have to do is get the far right column and subtract the far left column. And we basically have that with first invader and last invader right here. So we can say that our grid dot width should be equal to our last invader dot position dot x minus our first invader dot position dot x as well. So now when we save this and refresh, when we start eliminating sides of our invaders, you'll see that it's automatically populated and it is a lot better than it was before, but you'll see that those definitely went off screen. And that is because when we're referencing the far invader over here, the position is of the top left of the invader. We're not actually getting the right side of that last invader. So we need to make sure when we're setting our grid width right here that we add on our last invader dot width, or we can just add on 30. doesn't really matter, but if I save and refresh and then start trying to eliminate sides of the actual grid, get the left side here, Let's go ahead and watch what happens. Eventually, it's going to collide. So this all looks great for our grid width, but we also need to make sure that we are setting our grid position because our position on the left-hand side is going to be affected by however many columns have been removed from the left as well. So we want to go ahead and say our grid position dot X is also equal to our first invader's position. So first invader position dot X. And that should take into account both the right and left-hand sides. Let's go ahead and start removing the right-hand side over here. That did take that into account correctly. Let's remove some of the left side. And it looks like that is good to go as well. So if we go back to to do, we just went ahead and we took care of 7a. We took into account the new grid width. But one more thing I almost forgot to do this is within this if statement right here, I wanna go ahead and create an else that says if our grid invaders length is zero, meaning all the invaders have been removed, we wanna go ahead and select our grids and then splice out the grid index that we're currently on. That way we're doing garbage collection. We're not animating any code that doesn't need to be there. We want to remove one from this specific grid index. And to select our grid index, we can go to the very top here of our grids for each, add a comma, select grid index. And now that should remove our grids behind the scene. We're not going to see any update drastically right here on the front end, but it's going to go ahead and make sure our game is performant as we begin continuing development. So now if I go back to to do, now we can actually check off 7a. So now let's go ahead and make sure that our invaders can actually shoot back at us. So to get invaders shooting back at our player, we're going to want to go ahead and focus on our projectiles class because if we think about it, what is an invader shooting? Well, it's going to be shooting a projectile. It's just going to look a little different from the projectile our player is shooting instead. So let's go ahead and find our projectile class. And here, all I want to do is duplicate this class so we can create one for our invaders. I'm going to go ahead and paste it right below and I'm going to call this invader projectile. So we have a projectile that's going to have a velocity and position associated with it. The only thing that's going to be different is I don't want these to be circular like our player shoots right here. I want these to actually be more rectangular, similar to like what you would see in the original game. So we're not going to be shooting a circle right here. We are actually going to be shooting a rectangle. To create a rectangle, I can type C dot fill rect and then I need a position so I'm going to reference our position dot x our position dot y and then we need some sort of width so I'm going to reference this dot width and then height with this dot height so we actually haven't created a width or height for our invader projectile yet let's go ahead and do that now we can delete radius because we're no longer going to be using that but we will be using this dot width and let's go ahead and set this something small to start let's go ahead and say three and this dot height, let's set it equal to something like 10. And I also want to make sure right before we fill our rect that I say the fill style should be white. That is the color I want our invader projectiles to be. So next up, what I can do is I can tell our invader class that we want a shoot method. So whenever we call invader.shoot, that one specific invader is going to shoot out an invader projectile. So within our invader class, right below update, I'm going to add in a shoot method. So what does this shoot method do? Well, we might need to pass through some sort of projectiles array for our invaders, specifically so we can add new projectiles into that array and get that array rendered out on the screen. So I'm going to pass through an invader projectiles array like so, 
And then once this is available to us, I want to push into this array a new invader projectile. What does an invader projectile take? It takes a position and a velocity as an object. So I'll go ahead and add the object in and then say that our position should be equal to what? Well, I need to reference the current invaders bottom side and right in the middle. So I'm going to set this equal to an object. What is our X going to be? It needs to be in the middle of whatever invader is about to shoot. So we are currently within a singular invader because we're within the invader class. All we need to do is get the position.x. So I'm going to say our position right here should be equal to this dot position dot x. And then I need to go ahead and add half the size of the invader to make sure it's from the direct center of the invader. So I'm going to say this dot width divided by two. We're adding that on to get the middle of our invader. And then we need to declare our y position. I want it at the bottom of our invader. So what I'm going to say is it should be this dot position dot y. And then we need to add on this dot height to get the bottom. So that's going to go ahead and place our invader projectile in the correct spot, but now we need to go ahead and declare a velocity. So we know we don't want our projectile going left or right. I'm going to say x should be equal to zero, but our y should be equal to something around five, five pixels per second. Now, since shoot uses an invader projectile's array, it makes sense that we create that. So right above our animate loop, I'll go ahead and add an array, and I'll actually add this up here to be a little consistent. I'm going to go ahead and call this invader projectiles, set it equal to an empty array like so. Now that we have this array, we can go ahead and start rendering out these projectiles on the screen. So what I'm going to say is right here below player, I'm going to reference invader projectiles, go ahead and call for each, say for each invader projectile, create an arrow function. And then what do I want to do? I want to call that invader projectile singular call that update function on top of it. So that's going to make sure that these are rendered out correctly on the screen when we start pushing them into the array using shoot. So now we just need a spot to call invader.shoot. And we want to make sure that we select a random invader within each grid to call shoot to add a nice effect into our game. So in order to spawn projectiles, I can scroll down to where we are spawning enemies and I can go ahead and spawn projectiles as well. So here I can add an if statement that says I want to shoot a projectile for every 100th frame. So I could say if our frames divided by 100 has a remainder equal to zero and we have invaders in the first place. So what I would want to do is add an and statement to say if our current grid has invaders and the length is greater than zero, then we want to go ahead and call shoot. But one issue here is we're referencing grid, but we're not actually looping through any of our grids. So actually it doesn't really make sense to call spawn projectiles here. It makes more sense to call it where we're looping through our grids. So right here, and I can paste in that code, say that this is where we are spawning our projectiles. So within this if statement, I can go ahead and say, I wanna go ahead and grab our invaders array. And I wanna grab a random invader within this array. So how do I get a random invader? Well, we can call math.random to get any value, zero through one. And then we can multiply this by our grid.invaders.length. So however many invaders are within the array, and then we can go ahead and floor this because whenever we pass a number through as an index here within an array, we need to make sure that it is a whole value. So go ahead and get math.floor floor the whole thing, and this is going to go ahead and give us a random invader. So now we've selected a random invader that's available to us, we can go ahead and call dot shoot on top of it. And remember what shoot takes, it takes an invader projectile. So we can go ahead and call invader projectiles. This is actually taking the whole array, not just one singular projectile. So just keep that in mind, because that is what we're going to be pushing something into. So we call dot shoot, we save and we refresh, and let's see if we can get some projectiles. Okay, so there's one that looks great. There's another, and this is just happening for every 100th frame. No collision detection just yet, but this is exactly what we want. You'll see they're coming from different invaders and coming from the direct center. And now that we have a different grid, this grid is also saying, well, for every 100th frame, I want to shoot a new projectile. It makes our game a lot harder. And this is going to keep happening. And you'll see this works as I remove them for every grid that we keep adding on to our game. So now this one's going to start shooting. Looks great, makes our game hard, but still fun to play. So for garbage collection, we need to make sure that we are removing all these projectiles once they go off the screen. So where are we looping through our invader projectiles? Right here within our animate loop. We wanna go ahead and do the same thing we did for our projectiles right here, just in the opposite direction. So what I can say is if our invader projectile dot position dot y plus its height, so invader projectile 
dot height is greater than or equal to our canvas height. So the bottom of the screen, what do I want to do? I want to go ahead and call set timeout. Same thing right here. I'm going to paste that in the new if conditional, but I don't want to call this on projectiles. I want to make sure I'm calling this within invader projectiles. So I'm going to go ahead and call it there. But remember, if we reference an index, we need to make sure we're putting that index within our for each loop. So I'm going to go ahead and add a comma, put index right here. And now we have an index to reference. Else, if this is not true, I want to go ahead and call projectile.update. So with save and refresh, we're not going to actually see this happen, but we can go ahead and console log out our invader projectiles to see them fill up and then to see them be removed. So if I save and refresh this, go over to console, you'll see we have one projectile, but once it goes off the screen, well, we keep going back to one. We keep removing whichever one goes off the screen and they keep producing a new one. So that's why we keep getting that additional one in here. But you'll see our garbage collection works. It's so going to make sure our game is nice and performant. So now all we need to do is make sure that whenever one of these projectiles hits our actual player, that our player is removed and the game ends. So within our invader projectiles array where we just were, we're going to go ahead and add some additional code here that says, if, if one, what is the collision detection code we need to write? Well, is the bottom of projectile greater than or equal to the top of our player? So let's go ahead and say, if our invader projectile dot position dot y plus its height, so the bottom of the projectile, invader projectile dot height is greater than or equal to our player dot position dot y, the top of our player, then we are going to remove our player from the game. So we can go ahead and console log out you lose if this is the case. Save and refresh. Let's go ahead and watch what happens. This is only on Y, so it should happen no matter where I am. And you'll see once he's past the top of our player, we start logging this out. But we want to make sure this only happens if it actually hits our player. So what we're going to do is continue on with this conditional and say, and if the right side of our projectile, so invader projectile dot position dot X plus invader projectile dot width is greater than or equal to the left side of our player. So player dot position dot X. Then we want to call you lose, but we also want to make sure we do the same thing for the left side of our projectile. So we'll add one more and statement and say if our invader projectile dot position dot X, that's going to give us the left side is less than or equal to our player position dot X plus our player width, which will give us the right side of the player. Then we want to console log you lose. This is where we remove and explode our player, which we will do shortly. So let's go ahead and watch what happens. If one of those goes by, we do not lose because they are not hitting us. But if it does, then we're going to console log out you lose. And you see, it's pretty precise for the most part when we console log that out. So that is how we are going to go ahead and have our invaders shoot back. So next up, I want to go ahead and create enemy explosions. What I mean by this is when we start shooting our enemies, I want to go ahead and create a particle explosion effect to really add some wow effects to our game. And I want to do the same thing for when one of these hits our player. I want our player to explode as well, just with a different color. So in order to create enemy and I guess also player explosions, we're going to want to go ahead and create a particle class. Now what is a particle? It's simply just a circle and we're just going to make sure that this has a different radius, maybe a different opacity compared to the other circles. That's all a particle is. So if we think about it, what class are we using right now that is circular? Well, simply our player projectile class. Can't really see it. Now we can. We need to make sure that we copy our projectile class as a particle because we're going to be reusing a lot of this code. So I'm going to go ahead and select our class of projectile right below. I'll go ahead and call this new one particle and everything is looking good. We're actually going to have a dynamic radius pass through. So I'm going to go ahead and change four right here to radius. Make sure I'm passing that through as a property right here. And I also want to start with a color. So I'm going to add this dot color and set it equal to whatever color we pass through. So if we're going to use some sort of color, we just need to make sure that we're referencing this dot color right here for fill style. And now that should take effect. So now we can start creating these particles. Well, the first thing we need to do is make sure these render out on the screen. So right above our animate loop, I'm going to go ahead and create a new array called particles. And then we just need to render these out. So we're going to render these out in the background right after player. I'm going to go ahead and select our particles array. And then for each particle within this array, create an arrow function, call that particle, and then call update. So that is going to take care of rendering them out. Now we just need to create them. Where do we want to create them? Well, where are our projectiles hitting our enemies? Let's go ahead and look for that. And it's going to be 
right here, projectiles hit enemy within this projectiles for each loop. So we know this really happens right about here within this collision detection code. So what we can do is right above set timeout, since that's only for removing projectiles and enemies, right above it, we can go ahead and create particles. So to create a particle, what I can do is I can go ahead and say for a particles array, I want to push a new particle. What does particle take? Well, a position, velocity, radius, and color. So position, what is this going to be equal to? Well, an X and a Y. And what X and Y do we want to use? Well, X should be equal to whatever invader we currently removed. So invader dot position dot X. I want to do the same thing for Y. Should be equal to our invaders position dot Y. And now it should really be spawning within the middle of our invader. Remember these by default are going to give us the top left of an invader. We want to go ahead and make sure this spawns in the center. So I'll also select our invaders width divided by two. That'll give us the middle on the X axis. And then I want to go ahead and add on invader height divided by two. That'll give us the middle on the Y axis. So I also need some sort of velocity associated with each particle. So I'll go ahead and say our velocity should be equal to, let's just go ahead and say X should be equal to two and y should be equal to two to start, just to make sure that these are rendering out. So y is two. That means it's going to go towards the bottom right hand side of our screen. What else do we need? We need a radius. Let's just make this something stupid or like 10, just so we can really see it, you know? And then I wanna go ahead and say that the color should be, let's just say yellow, something bright, so we can see it and make sure all this is working. So on save and refresh, if we start hitting enemies, we are creating these particles. That is the first step. But to create an explosion, we need multiple particles, not just one. So what we're going to do is we're going to wrap this in a for loop. So we're going to say for our iterator, which is i is equal to zero, we can go ahead and say we want to call this code. How many times? Let's go ahead and say 15 times. We'll create 15 particles per hit. And then we want to add on to our iterator to make sure all this for loop works. And then wrap particles push within this for loop. So if we were to call this as is, we hit an enemy, it's creating 15 particles, they're just overlapped on top of each other. This is where we want to start randomizing things like our velocity and radius. So to randomize our velocity, instead of using two, I'm going to use math.random to give us any value zero to one. And I'll do the same thing for y, math.random, anything zero to one. Save and refresh, hit an enemy, and you'll see now they go in most lead different directions. We don't have any going to the left or up. And to fix that, we can go ahead and subtract 0.5 from both of these equations. Why does this work? Well, remember, math.random assigns a value 0 to 1. So if we get something like 0 and subtract 0 0.5, we get a negative 0.5. But if we get the high end value 1 and then subtract 0 0.5, then we are only getting 0.5, which means things are going to either go down or to the right. So by doing this and refreshing, hitting an enemy, you'll see now they go in all sorts of directions, looking really cool. Now let's go ahead and randomize our radius a little bit. Instead of calling just 10, let's go ahead and make sure that we call math.random on this as well. And I want this to be something larger than just anywhere zero to one. Let's go ahead and multiply this by three. Save and refresh, hit. That's looking pretty good. That looks like an actual explosion from one of these invaders. A few things we need to fix is I want this to happen a little quicker velocity wise. So I'll go ahead and wrap the statement right here and then multiply it by two to make sure we get any value from negative one to one. We're going to do that for this one as well. Wrap it in parentheses, multiply by two. And that should make our velocity a bit quicker, which it definitely is. That's looking great. And you may notice when I hit some of these enemies, while well, the explosion is actually happening twice, and it's the same deal as sometimes we actually just call this code twice because we actually haven't found a valid invader or projectile like we're looking for down here. So we want to make sure that we're moving this for loop code, everything that we're just creating within invader found. So we're going to move it within here to make sure everything's actually found. This is where we remove our enemies. And we're also going to be creating these new particles. So now that should get rid of any double explosions. And then I want to change the color of our explosions from yellow to the actual color of the invaders. So this is going to be a hex code. It's going to be BAA0DE on save and refresh. That should be that light purple that we see, which it is, and that is looking great. But now I actually want to fade these particles out over time. And once they fade down to zero, I want to remove them from our scene for garbage collection, make sure that our game is running as smoothly as possible. So in order to fade these particles out, what I can do is I can go up to our particles class right here, and I'm going to give these an opacity. I'm going to say that this dot opacity by default is going to be equal to one, which means we see everything. And then over time, I want to fade our opacity out. 
So within draw, I'm going to go ahead and call c.save because I only want this code to affect this right here. This is a global statement. So I'm going to go ahead and say c.restore at the end. And then I want to go ahead and call c.global alpha and set it equal to this dot opacity. And that's going to fade out whatever code we have right here. But only if we are actually subtracting some value from this dot opacity in the first place. So within update, I can go ahead and say this dot opacity should have a certain value subtracted from it, 0 0.01. So if we save that, refresh, hit some enemies, you're going to see these fade out over time, but eventually they come back to life because when we start going in the negatives here with global alpha and opacity, it just starts getting all wonky. They come back. We want to make sure that we remove these when opacity is equal to zero. So where are we looping through our particles? It's going to be down here, particles for each. And this is where we're looping through everything. We can say right here, if our particle dot opacity is less than or equal to what? Zero. Then we want to go ahead and select our particles array splice out at what index while well, the index we're currently looping over so right here within for each i'm going to say i want to splice out at that index one value from that index and to make sure we don't get any flickering we'll wrap this in set time out with an arrow function which has a zero as a second argument put particle splice inside of that else we want to go ahead and continue updating our particle so now if we go ahead and console log out no other than particles like so we should see this being populated and then it should go back to nothing so if i shoot one of the enemies we have our particles and eventually when those equal zero for the opacity we remove them all from the scene and our game is a lot more performant than it would be otherwise they all go back to zero so let's go ahead and make sure that this explosion is also created when one of these hits our player so how do we do that? Where are these actually hitting our player? Well, we know right here when we console log out to you lose, this is when an enemy projectile hits our player. So in order to recreate that effect just in a different location, we can go ahead and search for that for loop, which is right here. We want to reuse this code, but if we want to go ahead and make this as clean as possible, it probably makes sense to store this as a function rather than calling this whole for loop over again. So I'm going to actually cut out this for loop right here, and I'm going to call a function before I create it called create particles. And I'll just leave that as is for now, but if I scroll up right above our animate loop, I'll create one more function called create particles, and then I'll paste in that for loop inside of it. So if we look at this, what kind of code do we actually need to add here? Well, it looks like we're going to need an invader or we're going to need an object because if we want this code to run in a different position, such as where our player is, well, our player wouldn't be classified as an invader, it'd be classified as a more generic object. So we're going to go ahead and replace invader with object instead. We're going to make sure that we pass that through as a property argument right here with an object. And then what else do we want to change besides the position of our object? Well, probably our color because when our player explodes, well, it shouldn't be the same purple as our enemies. So we'll pass through a color property as well, and then say color should be equal to, not this hex code, but rather the color we're passing through. We can also put a default here by adding an or operator and then pasting in that hex code that we just cut out. So now that we know how this function works with create particles, it takes an object and a color. We can go back to where we called it initially, pass through an object, like so, what is that object going to be for when we take off an invader? It's going to be our invader object. And then our color by default is going to be that purple. So we don't actually need to pass anything through. By saving and refreshing with just this, we still have our particles being created with the correct color. Now we just need to make sure we're doing so when one of these hits our player, which is going to be pretty easy with this function. We simply just go ahead and copy this and find where we are losing the game right here and then create our particles. But instead of using an invader object, we want to use no other than our player object. And we want to change the color of our projectiles, or the particles at least, to white. So now when one of the enemies hits us, we should see some particle explosions, which we do indeed see. That looks great. But at the same time, we probably want to remove our player from the game. And we probably want to also remove the projectile that hit us. So we're also going to do that now. We want to go ahead and say we want to splice out the current projectile that hit us. So I'm going to take this right here, paste it within this conditional. We can go ahead and state what this is. Projectile hits player. 
So that should remove the projectile. Let's go ahead and see. We get hit by that. It does indeed remove the projectile each time it hits us. And now we just need to remove our player when an enemy hits it. It's going to be a little tricky actually. So if we look at to do, we just created enemy explosions and I know we haven't removed our player. We're going to do that for number 12 because it is a little tricky to remove our player and stop the game. That's basically going to be our lose condition. But next up, let's go ahead and create some background stars to make this game a little more lively. What are background stars? Well, they're going to be little particles in our background here that actually move as our game proceeds. It's going to be really cool and make it look like our player is actually going through a bunch of stars. So the cool thing is to create background stars, we can use the same exact particles class and particles array that we just created. So how are we going to do that? So to create these particles, we can actually reuse this for loop within our create particles function. Now we could extend this function so that we could use it to create these star particles in the background, but it's probably going to be more effort than it's actually worth. So we're going to leave this as is for our enemy and player explosions, but we're going to go ahead and take the code out of it. And right above where we created this function, we can call that inner code. So what we're saying is for 15 times, we want to push in a new particle. Now, where do we want to push in these new particles? These star particles should be laid out on our screen in random locations across the X axis and across the Y axis. So what we can do is for position, we can delete this code right here and say, if we want these particles placed randomly on the X axis, we can call math dot random and multiply it by our canvas dot width add a comma, and then we're going to do the same thing for y, say our y should be placed anywhere, math.random times canvas height, and then our velocity. I want these particles to be going towards the bottom of the screen. Why? So it looks like our player is actually moving through the galaxy. So I don't actually want these moving on the x-axis. I'm going to say our velocity x should be equal to zero, but our y should be equal to one, which means we're pushing these down. And then our color should be equal to white these are white stars and then our radius should be i think three might be okay maybe we want to go down to two to make these smaller but i think this should be all right let's go ahead and save and refresh and we see we have some particles in the background but they fade out immediately and i think i do want to go down to two that looks more like stars to me let's go ahead and create a hundred of these bad boys instead of just 15. i'll go ahead and do that by changing 15 to 100 right here save and refresh and now we have a ton of stars in the background, but obviously they're fading out because they're taking into account the opacity code that we created for our particles. So since these are different, we can go over to our particle class and I'm going to add another property in here called this dot fades. And this is going to be equal to a fades property. Now we actually pass through our constructor argument. So fades. And then I want to say, well, we should only be subtracting our opacity right here if this dot fades actually exists if it is equal to true. So with that, save and refresh. Now these are not fading, but you'll see neither are our enemy particles. So where we are spawning our enemy particles, we can go ahead and search for create particles. And then I want to set fades equal to true here. I'm going to search for create particles again, set fades equal to true for when we hit an enemy. And now I'm not quite done just yet because this create particles function right here also needs to take whether or not these are going to fade. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, when we pass through fades right here, well, when we're creating a new particle, we also need to pass through that fades. Honestly, we could just go ahead and set fades true equal to here instead of in those opposite positions. But since I already did it, let's go ahead and just say fades is equal to fades. Let's save and refresh. Now when I hit an enemy, these particles are indeed fading and when it hits our player, but the ones in the background are not. So all we have to do now is make sure these background particles, when they reach the bottom of the screen, we respawn them on the top in random positions to make it look like as if we just entered some new section of the galaxy. So we're not going to be spawning any new particles when they reach the bottom, we're just going to be repositioning those current ones. So within our particles for each loop, within animate, I can go ahead and say if the particle we're looping over, get the position dot y minus the particle's radius is greater than or equal to what? Our canvas height. And then I wanna go ahead and set our particle position on the X axis to what? Well, any value with math.random across our canvas width. So when it reaches the bottom down here, we're going to put the particle at a new position across the X axis. And we're also going to say on the Y axis that we should put it at the very top of our canvas where we cannot see it. So I'm gonna go ahead and say our Y position should then be equal to 
our particle radius, but the negative value, and that should put it off the top of our canvas whenever these particles move towards the bottom. So they move towards the bottom, but you'll see now they are being respawned at the top. We're not creating any new particles. We're just using the same exact particles we actually created to create this movement effect. Now these are going kind of fast. I want to go ahead and slow them down so it actually looks like we're in a galaxy. To do that, all I need to do is go to where we created these particles in the first place. I can slow these down to something like 0.2 for our Y velocity, and maybe even something a little quicker like 0.3. And I think that looks really good for our background star particles. So within to-dos, we just created some background stars. Now let's go ahead and finish this up with a loose condition. So when it hits our player, our player actually explodes. I mean, it is exploding, but we want to remove the player. And then we kind of want to pause our game to show you can no longer play. So to finish this lose condition, what I want to happen is when one of these hits our player, well, the player is going to be removed from the screen. But if we look with an animate where we actually lose the game, and we are splicing out our projectile that hits us right here within set to time out. Well, if we just set our player equal to null, it's going to break our whole animation loop because we're relying on player and so many other locations within our game. So instead what I'm going to do, and I can do this within set time out as well, I want to set our player dot opacity equal to zero instead. So we're going to go ahead and hide the player, but I want to make sure that I stop the game or at least I stop the player from being able to shoot while the opacity is zero. So I'm also going to say that our game dot over is equal to true. So game dot over does not exist. Neither does opacity equal to zero. So let's go ahead and create those. So in order to create our game dot over, I'm going to go ahead up to our variables here, create a new let called game equal to an object with over set this equal to false. And later we're also going to be using a property called active, which I'm also going to set to false as well while we're here. And then I know within player, I want to go ahead and add an opacity to our player. So this dot opacity is going to be equal to one to start. And then to add opacity to our player, well, we already have save and restore functions within draw. So simply we can add C dot global alpha, set it equal to this dot opacity. And that should take care of that. So now on refresh, when an enemy hits us with their projectile, we disappear, but you'll notice I could still shoot even though we don't actually exist. So down where, we set our opacity equal to zero. We know we also set our game over equal to true. So if our game is over within our event listeners right here, we should not be able to run any of this code. So what we can do is we can add an if statement to the very top of this. And we can simply say if game.over, then we want to go ahead and return, meaning we're not going to call any of the following code. We should no longer be able to shoot projectiles. Do we need anything right here? Well, not really. So let's go ahead and just add a game over to the first event listener on key down. Save and refresh. Let an enemy hit us. It hits us. We try shooting. No longer allowed. We cannot move. Technically our game is over, but we may want to stop the game to prevent it from moving, to prevent our enemies from moving and spawning new ones. So back where we declared game.over right here, we also want to declare our game.active should be equal to false. We don't want our game moving anymore. But instead of calling this within the set timeout that fires right away, I'm actually going to duplicate the set timeout and call it after about two seconds, so 2000 milliseconds. I'm going to call within the set timeout after we lose the game, game.active should be equal to false. This is going to allow our game to animate for two seconds after our player dies. That way we can see the explosion effect and the enemies move, but it's going to stop the game after we set game.active equal to false. So all we have to do here is right above request animation frame. We can add a conditional that says if our game is not active, then we want to go ahead and return. We don't want to run any of the following code. And let's go ahead and make sure that our game is active to start. Say it's equal to true. Save and refresh, let an enemy hit us, and then after two seconds, our game should stop, which it does. So our game is no longer active. So that is how we are going to take care of the lose condition for our game. We can go ahead and check that off. Let's go ahead and add a score to the top left-hand corner, and then we're going to make this a fixed width canvas. So to create a score, we're actually going to use a combination of HTML and JS. So over here within our game, I'm going to go over to index.html and I'm going to create a new tag. I'm going to make this a paragraph tag because typically I think of those as like small text-like tags. So I'm going to go ahead and call this P. I'm going to go ahead and create a span tag inside of it called score colon. And then I'm going to add a second span tag with a space in between right here. 
And this is going to be our score, make it zero to start. So if I save and refresh this, now we have a score at the top left, but we want this overlaid on top of our game. So this is how we're going to do it. I'm just going to use inline styles here. So I'm going to create a style and set it equal to the CSS classes we want for this element right here. So I want its position to be fixed, which means it's going to be overlaid on top of whatever is behind it, such as our canvas. I want to go ahead and make sure that it's the index is above the canvas, so set it equal to something like 10. Could be one, honestly. And then I want to make sure that this color, the text color, is white, so we can actually see it on top of the canvas right here. So with this, if I save and refresh, you'll see that our score label is laid out on the top left-hand corner of our screen. Now this looks a little silly to me, so I'm going to keep styling this. I want a little bit of margin on the left, so I'm going to go ahead and say that this should be placed from the left-hand side of our screen by about, let's say, five pixels to start. Refresh, see how that looks. We definitely need a lot more than that. Let's go ahead and say it should be 10. Refresh, that looks good, but we also want to be closer to the top of our screen. So we'll add in another style here called top, set it equal to 10px. And on refresh, that's fine, even though it just pushed it down, because by default, the browser adds margin to paragraph tags. So we want to set our margin equal to zero for this paragraph tag right here. Save and refresh, and that looks to be in a very good location. And now to make this a little more in line with our game, I'm going to go ahead and say our font family should be equal to sans serif to get rid of this old, old timey feel that we have right now with those little edges on the end of each of our characters. So by changing this to sans serif, now that is looking maybe a little goofier just because it's bigger, but if we make this smaller with font size and set it equal to something like 14 pixels instead of the 16 that it is right now, we start looking a bit more professional and we have something a little more up to date. So now I'm just going to go ahead and clean this code up a little bit by indenting our paragraph tag and our spans. And this span right here, the second one with our score, is the one we're going to want to deal with within our JavaScript. So here I'm going to go ahead and add an ID of score L, which stands for score element. And I need this just so when we go to index.js, I can actually select this one element we have right here. So how do we select score L? Well, at the top of our JavaScript file, we're going to select it the same way we selected our canvas. What we can do is we can copy this line, paste it, reference score L, and then select an ID with score L. So if we go ahead and console log this out to test, we actually selected it. Save and refresh, there's our element. Now we can begin changing this as our game continues. So now right above our animate loop, where we are creating new let. I wanna add in a let of score so we can use JavaScript to actually increment the score over time. So now that I have the score let in place, where are we actually increasing our score? Well, where we hit an enemy. So where are we removing enemies? Remove invader. Right here, where this is commented, is where we are removing things. So we can also say within this if statement, whenever we remove an enemy, we want to add a score of 100 onto the current score. So now if we console log this out, specifically score, you'll see when we hit an enemy, it doesn't increase over here, but it does increase over here within our console. So all we need to do is go ahead and select that score L and say that it's inner. HTML should be equal to what? Simply our score right here. And this is all we have to do. So on save and refresh, we hit some enemies and you'll see our score is increasing in both places. It's as simple as that. And our score will continue to increase until we get hit and we cannot score anymore. So if we go back to to do, that leaves us with a fixed width canvas. So our game works very well right now on this screen resolution, but if I were to increase or decrease this, it might not work as well. So I just wanna make sure that this is a fixed width that can be playable on most browser sizes. So let's head back to our code. And I want this to be an aspect ratio of 16 by nine. I'd say that's pretty standard. And I wanna go ahead up to where I am declaring our canvas width and canvas height. Should be pretty simple for the most part. Instead of referencing the full width of our window right here, I want to reference a fixed value of 1024. And then I want the aspect ratio of 16 by nine, which I believe is 576. So when I save this and refresh, you're going to see now our game has that fixed aspect ratio. So if I go ahead and exit out of our console, this is what it looks like. And now it's going to be playable on this size and we can fine tune it to this size. So it's good for larger screen sizes 
and maybe even smaller screen sizes. But this looks a little silly right now, so all we want to do is make sure that we center this within our screen, and maybe we even want to make the background a different color, just so people know that this is the playable area right here. So here's what I'm going to do, is right here within our body tag, I'm going to add a display of flex, which if we save and refresh, it's going to extend whatever elements are inside of this to the very bottom, the full height of the screen. We don't want that. So to fix this, all we need to do is wrap our canvas element inside of a div. And that means this flex styling right here is only going to affect this one div and our canvas should stay the same height as it was prior. So save and refresh, and that does indeed work, which is great. But now our div is taking up the full height instead of the canvas element. So we're using flex right here to center this canvas. And to center this canvas, I can go ahead and select justify content and set it equal to center. So with this on save and refresh, now our canvas is centered on the X axis. We also want to center it for the Y axis. So we can go ahead and call align items and also set that to center. So I'm saving and refresh. Now this is centered as well. But you'll notice our score label is way up here. It's relative to the browser window rather than relative to our canvas div. This is where we want it inside of this div right here. So I'm going to go ahead and copy our paragraph, paste it inside of the div, make sure things are indented relatively good. Save and refresh. We still get the same effect. Why? Because position fixed is always going to be relative to the window. Instead, we want to use position absolute which is always going to be relative to whatever element has a position of relative. None have them right now, but we want it relative to this div right here, which contains our canvas. So we can add a style tag onto our div and set its position equal to relative. So now this is going to take effect and be relative to our div instead. So on save and refresh, now our score is in the correct spot and everything is looking really good. The only thing you may want to change is maybe change the background color of your game right here. All you have to do to do that is add a background dash color property onto body. And you can set this to anything you like. If you just like it to be black like everything else, set it equal to black. Now you have this little grid that kind of meshes in well with the rest of the game. I might even keep it at this, but we maintain that aspect ratio. So when someone plays on a larger screen size, well, our game is going to be playable for them, but it's also going to be playable for those smaller screen sizes. So if we go back to to do, we just added a fixed width canvas. We can check this off. And now, even though this tutorial is ending, if you'd like to continue, you can go on to the premium section as long as I've actually completed it. And here we're going to cover things such as dynamic score labels, bombs and machine gun power up, progressively harder enemies, spaceship sprite animations, start and game over UI, and then add sound effects and music. Otherwise guys, thanks for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this tutorial and I'll be sure to see you in the next one. Peace.